Okay, I'm going to combine chapters 8 and 9 into one video here, and I um, hope it's not too long. But we're talking about, chap we start with chapter 8, where we're talking about marketing channels and how we can use those to create values for customers. And we see it's, it's about uh, what we call time-based competition. You know, customers want stuff and they want it right then. Uh, if I go to Best Buy and they don't have what I want and they say, well, I can order it for you and it'll be here in a week, I say, forget that, I can order it and go out to my car or order it on my phone um, from Amazon and have it here tomorrow. So so really getting stuff, but then if I, if I keep too much stuff on hand, that inventory is very costly to me. So the longer it sits in inventory, the, the longer it's eating up my resources and that's money I don't have available for other things. So it's a very, very tricky thing, and um, and it's an increasingly important part of both manufacturing and merchandising, to have the inventory there when you need it, but not before you need it. And so if you don't have it there, you lose sales. If you have it there too long, you um, are losing opportunities, and it's costing you money. So companies spend a lot of time and money trying to make this process as efficient as possible. So we'll talk in this one. Um, the marketing channels, uh, at the simplest form, is just a producer straight to the consumer. So if you're at a farmer's market buying something or at a craft show, it's going right from the, produ pr from the producer to the consumer. Most other transactions, though, will involve an intermediary who are somewhere between the producer and the, and the, and the consumer. And so these intermediaries perform services for both sides that add value to the for the customer or make things easier for the producer. Um, and so they they help with these four things: time, form, place, and ownership. And so we'll we'll kind of talk about each of of these. Um, the the producer will use intermediaries because he's trying to. Um, uh, um, he's trying to get um, more customers, and so sometimes the intermediary can open up new channels to him, new customers. Sometimes it's not getting more customers, or sometimes it's just a matter of getting the right customers. Maybe the right customers aren't in his geographic area, or he just can't get to them, and so an intermediary can help with that. Um, so, uh, the other uh, things that intermediaries provide are um, marketing, uh, guidance and expertise, um, shipping and, uh, handling services, uh, that kind of thing. Um, uh, maybe the producer needs credit. So the intermediaries provide, uh, credit to producers. But all of these things are really services to the producer to help them uh, in getting it to the end consumer. So, so the retail or the the intermediaries, you know, that's why a producer. It, it would be cheaper for a producer to go straight to the consumer. But because intermediaries form all these um, services to producers, that's why they're willing to take a little less profit because a lot of times it means they'll get more sales or be able to save costs elsewhere. So a marketing channel is just a group of organization selling and promoting the good. So these are going to be, again, in between the producer and the consumer. And the supply chain, which we talk about a little bit more in Chapter 9, is everybody involved in delivering it. So this will go, the supply chain will go what we call upstream to the consumers and downstream all the way to suppliers and that kind of thing. Whereas the marketing channel is more just kind of upstream, kind of just um, uh, pushing that forward to the to the consumers. So the main two types we see in the marketing channel are in the these are the intermediaries. Oops, um, intermediaries here would be wholesalers and retailers. And so this this slide kind of outlines the, some of the processes that they give to you. Um, they can buy things in large quantities and then they can break it down. It's called breaking bulk. They buy them in bulk and then break them up and sell them to, um, uh, so that can be a huge help for a smaller retailer, but also it allows the, um, the producer to sell still in large bulk and then the, the wholesaler will be the one to break it down. 
So wholesalers go from the producer to the retailer. A retailer goes to the consumer, either straight from the producer or from a wholesaler. So um, wholesalers don't sell right to consumers, they sell to other retailers. Um, some of them take title to the goods, and so that kind of assumes the risk of selling it, which is a big um, relief for the uh, producer. If it doesn't sell, it doesn't matter to him. You know, he's already been paid for it. And um, we'll talk about the three different types there. A retailer buys stuff from either wholesalers or distributors or directly from the producer and then sells them to consumers. So we'll talk about the different types of retailers as well. So the three different types of wholesalers that we have, a merchant wholesaler um, is a, a kind of a, a full service wholesaler. They, um, they probably operate warehouses, they maintain inventory, they have warehouses where they keep stuff. Um, uh, so that would be a full service one. They're actually a, of different levels here. Um, they probably supply credit to their buyers, which are retailers. Um, there are also limited services ones that don't do quite that much. Same way within a retail, how you'll have um, um, full service retailers, and then some are more self service. Uh, um, and generally, again, those have lower prices because they're not offering as many services. A broker. Is someone so so these guys up here will um, take title. Uh, they actually purchase the the goods and then resell them. Whereas a broker doesn't um, uh, doesn't take ownership. I have a new tablet and a, a new ta a pen and I, I feel like it's not writing as well, but we'll see. Um, doesn't take ownership. They're just kind of, they get the buyer and seller together. So kind of like a real estate agent would be that. Um, uh, they they don't purchase it. They just kind of negotiate the sale. Um, negotiate. I don't think that's negotiate. Uh, between the buyer and the seller. So again, much like a real estate agent. And then a manufacturer sales office, they, they perform warehousing or wholesaling services, but just for one firm. So this is a, a business to business kind of thing. Um, and they just work for one manufacturer. Um, car dealerships might have that kind of thing, you know, um, or, or not dealerships, sorry, but manufacturers. Um, types of retailers, you're probably familiar with a lot of these. Supermarkets, um, like a grocery store, they're self-service ones, so they don't provide full service, but they have you know a range of products. Convenience goods are generally going to be a little bit higher, higher price, and uh, it's all about location with those. Specialty stores will just sell one type of product, but then they have a deep line in it. So a sporting goods store... Um, or a bookstore or a shoe store or anything like that. So they just have one type of thing, but they have a lot of them. Whereas a department store has a wider variety, but not, not as deep, um, usually, because they're carrying so many things. A superstore is an oversized department store, lots of stuff, plus groceries. So this would be like the Targets with the grocery stores or a Walmart with the grocery store and that kind of thing. Um... Warehouse clubs, that would be like Sam's Club or something like that. Off-price retailers, those would be like um, TJ Maxx or um, oh, what's that other one over there? Marshall, something like that, um, that sell a variety of discount things. Outlets operate under a, a brand of a single manufacturer. So we have the outlets there in Hagerstown. That would be the perfect example of that one. Um, a lot of times it's, it's mistakes, but sometimes I don't think it is. Sometimes I don't even think they're that cheaper. Um, online retailers. So there's, you know, there's plenty of those. Like, um, a lot of stores have both. They have a brick and mortar store and an online, or you've got some stores that are strictly online, like Amazon or something. Uh, used retailers, you know, maybe Second and Charles is a used bookstore or thrift stores or any kind of thing like that. 
pop-up stores are, are temporary things. It might be like a kiosk that opens up in the mall around Christmas, or it might be, you know, those, um, at Halloween, those ones, they pop up into empty store spaces where somebody else has moved out or hasn't been rented, but they're just a very kind of temporary thing to try to, so it's either it's just a seasonal thing or they're try they pop up temporarily to try and generate some regular or some, some new business. There's also non-store retailing. So there's um, door-to-door sales, which you see less of, but you still see like magazine kind of a thing. Party selling. So like 31 parties or sulpata jewelry parties. And there's a million of those now. And those are actually uh, really successful because, you know, you get these people, then people feel obligated to buy something because their friend's having a party. And so um, that actually sells a good bit. Selling via catalogs. Um, a lot of times people don't buy from the catalogs, but the catalog stimulates an online purchase. There's a lot of that. So that's why companies still, you know, people look at the catalog and then they go online to purchase it. And a lot of people do that. And a lot of online sales are still um, started through the catalog. So that's why people spend the money for that. Or selling via TV. So you've got... Um, infomercials, you know, that kind of thing, or those shopping channels, um, QVC and Home Shopping Network and that kind of thing. Um, and then the telemarketing where you, you call and try to get a sale like that. That's tougher with the do not call registry. So there's, you see a little bit less of that now, but, um, uh, but they still try. Um, and that, and some of these uh, these guys would also apply to nonprofits as well. They still use those. Disintermediation is a situation where intermediaries are being cut out, and so uh, again, they they do it to to save money, right? Because the more people you have between the producer and the consumer, everybody in there is taking their cut. And, and so uh, if we're trying to cut costs to the consumer, you know, if my product is a little bit cheaper, I'll increase sales. Uh, I do it this way. So I'm trying to improve profits. There is an increasing trend toward that. The Internet makes it easier to reach these people. But it's not always going to be the best. So there are plenty of times, again, when those, those um, um, the uh, intermediaries are performing a service. So we have to... Um, if you, if you take that out, then you have to do that yourself. And sometimes we can't do that as well. But uh, a lot of times when firms are trying to lower their costs, this is one of the first things they do. So it is a trend there. Some international things. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, again, if you're going into a less developed country, they might not have an intermediary system. Sometimes here, um, intermediaries are even more important to get somebody that understands how things work in that business. And... Uh, um, uh, if you don't know the process, it can be very difficult to be successful there. So there's different um, ways to kind of do that and different ways to get involved. And those can be those can be even more important if you're going into a market that's very different than your own. So um, channel functions, uh, the marketing, communication, and promoting the brand. So there's the push strategy where the manufacturer gives incentives to the resellers, to the wholesalers and the retailers to push at the, cu at the customer. So when you see um, displays that they have up in the store, you know, that's to kind of push it. Or if they offer incentives to salespeople in the store. So, you know, let's say I go into Best Buy to look at a TV and I don't really have a strong brand preference. Um, they might push me towards a certain brand because they get incentives and win things if they sell this many LG TVs or whatever it is. So you're pushing it through the system from the manufacturer to the consumer. A pull strategy, the manufacturer goes directly to the consumer so that the consumer contacts the retailer and says, hey, I want this brand, and then the reseller goes to the manufacturer. So it's really whether the manufacturing efforts are aimed at the reseller or at the consumer, and then I pull it through the process that way. Channel functions, what they do, again, this is the sort and regroup. This is what we talked about with the, the breaking the bulk part. And um, they buy it. Uh, wholesalers and distributors will, um, that's pretty much what we're, wholesalers and distributors 
will buy it and bulk, and bulk and sell it. And so that's the, the store inventory, which again, for a small business that doesn't have a lot of space, can be help it. They can help distribute. Sometimes they have their own trucking systems or the warehousing systems. Again, sometimes they take ownership, uh, which means if it doesn't sell, uh, they're the ones left holding the bag. So that that lessens the risk on the producers and the retailers. Uh, sometimes they ex- extend credit and uh, they share marketing information. They can be a really good source of information, especially to a growing business because they've got, they're out there, they know what's going on in different industries and they can really provide a lot of information to you on what your competitors are doing or what consumers are saying. And, and so they, um, they have a big source of information and, um, and make sure it's available to the customers when they want it. They can really help with that process. And we talked at the beginning of this uh, chapter about how important that is. So this is what they do. Again, with this increasing push towards disintermediation, they really need to um, emphasize these and figure out what what their retailers value and so uh, and, and producers and, and really make sure they provide that in there. So, So this is what they do. And, you know, they just have to continue to add value to the process to make it worth that um, that cut in there so they don't get cut out. So when I'm uh, selecting the channel that I want to do this, I have to look at, for my business, what is the type of consumer? Am I selling to consumers or businesses? How do they prefer to get it? Do they want to shop online or do they want to go and look and touch this first? What type of product I'm doing? Is it perishable, which means time is really important? Is it uh, valuable or fragile, which again means it's riskier uh, the longer it's in shipping? And then what can my channel partners do for me versus what can I do myself? And what markets can they reach and can they help me reach not just more, but the right markets? So these are all things that I need to think about when I'm deciding if I need intermediaries and which ones I want to use. The intensity of the distribution. So intensive distribution is where I'm trying to get it out there in as many stores as possible. Uh, whereas selective distribution is when I'm, I'm only selling it at certain places. Sometimes for marketing purposes, I want to make it a little hard to get. The opposite of then would be the exclusive, which is, you know, you can't get a, I don't know, a Rolls Royce in Hagerstown, right? They're very, very exclusive. And that plays into the image that they have built for their product. So this is, you know, again, we're talking about one of the four P's, the, the, the place, but all four P's have to go together. So if I'm promoting this as a really high quality product, I would not want intensive distribution. If I'm, if I'm promoting it as a really good value, then I do. So this has to fit in with, um, fit in with the other three P's, uh, we'll say. Channel power is another thing. Sometimes um, uh, somebody emerges through this channel as a as a leader, it, and it's they get to kind of call the shot. So category killers have a big channel power, but sometimes sometimes the retailer has the power, sometimes the manufacturer has the power, and it kind of depends on what's going on. So Walmart, for example, is so huge that they can tell their manufacturers, okay, I want you to, um, I know that you produce this water in packs of six 12 ounce bottles for everybody else, but I want eight 10 ounce bottles instead. And that's very expensive for the manufacturer to have to change everything just for this one customer. But if Walmart makes up 70% of my business, I can't afford to lose that 70%. So I have to suck up those extra costs. So so Walmart, being because they're so big, as the retailer has a lot of power. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's the manufacturer that. And so, so it really, you know, if you've got something that somebody else wants, or if you're just really big, then you can get to call the shots and say what you want. And they have to. They pretty much have to do it or lose that business. Conflict, obviously, can arise among different channel members. Um, they all have their own goals, right? Um, uh, producers can compete, can compete with different channel members. So, um, uh, and everybody's, you know, especially if you're doing that push strategy and you're trying to get them, you know, you want the good shelf space for your product, uh, like grocery stores, for example, everybody wants to be on the eye, eye level aisle and, um, and how you get that. And so, 
uh, it can be, um, sometimes it's too, like, again, manufacturers are selling it online, which is cutting, you know, if people sell it online for cheaper than that they're selling it uh, in the store, you know, like say, say I'm selling it through Amazon for cheaper, then that can really um, create some conflict too. I don't want you to sell it through there. So I was just reading a thing about how um, Target doesn't sell the Kindle anymore because they don't sell Amazon products because um, they kind of got mad when Amazon was uh, pushing the idea that you can go to a store, scan in the barcode, and find it Amazon cheaper and just order it for your phone. It's called, I think it's called showcasing. So you go look at it in the store, make sure that's the one you want, but then you don't buy it from that store. And so the store's absorbing all the costs for the overhead and the inventory and all that, and then you go and buy it. I mean, I'm guilty of it. But, um, uh, but that's really, really, really tough on retailers. And so when Amazon was encouraging their customers to do it, Target's like, hey, that's really not nice. And so they stopped carrying Kindles. I'm not, I think that's true. I, it, it seemed like a good article that I was reading, but I, I, I just saw that once. But that, you can see the idea behind that one. Um, channel integration is, so, you know, there's all kinds of things to, to get people to cooperate um, within the channel. And again, kind of keeping, you know, Try it so that it, hopefully it turns into a win-win. But sometimes channels kind of integrate. So vertical integration is when different members up and down the um, the channel integrate. So it could be um, a manufacturer and a shipping company, or a manufacturer and one of their suppliers, or something like that. So let's say uh, a manufacturer buys out a supplier. So that was somebody I bought from, and now I I buy it. So that's vertical integration. And then um, horizontal integration is when two manufacturers of the same thing integrate or two um, shipping companies or two suppliers or something like that. So those are different types of, um, of integration that you see through the channel. And it does kind of reduce competition. So mergers and that kind of thing have to be approved by, by the FTC and, and all that uh, type of thing to make sure that everything's still fair. Um, the, the other, uh, vid I'm sorry, the other PowerPoint that was posted in there, I went through some kind of trends and developments in retail and they're not on the quiz and they're not even from this book, but I thought they were fairly interesting. So you can take a look at those if you, if you have time. And then that brings us to chapter nine, where we're talking about more about those supply chains and how we can use that to create value for our customers. So the supply chain um, is a little bit different. Again, the marketing channel was just kind of down, just, just to the customer part. But this can go upstream and downstream. So we can be going backwards to suppliers or forwards to customers and kind of moves in, in both directions there is the supply chain. And so anybody involved, anyone from the supplier all the way to the salesman, any of that kind of thing is, is supply chain. So some issues that we talk about in there are sourcing, is how we um, find and evaluate suppliers. Procurement is how we buy the stuff necessary, so purchasing and that kind of thing. You might have something similar where you where you work. Uh, with the sourcing, you know, outsourcing is when we have somebody else provide it. So sometimes um, they can provide more value. Outsourcing doesn't mean isn't the same as offshoring. So sometimes they can provide more. Um, more expertise, the more value, more effectiveness. So a lot of people outsource their payroll functions or their accounting functions. If you're not a big company, then um, uh, it's really hard to have all this expertise in-house. And so if somebody else can do it more efficiently, then that can generally provide value. So uh, some, a lot, like I said, a lot of times somebody else can do it better. So it makes sense to, to outsource those and focus on what you are good at. So, uh, again, if it provides value, and, and again, saving money is, is providing value or just making sure it's better. So, so um, this is uh, the types of things that were offshore. Now, outsource just means I have somebody outside my company do it. Offshore means I have somebody in another country do it. And so you can see the types of things. So, um, uh, manufacturing, warehouse and transportation, procurement, returns and customer service. You know a lot of places when you call customer service or tech support or something like that. 
it ends up, you know, your call is getting outsourced or offshored to somewhere else. And so rather than maintaining all that stuff in-house, these are the types of things that people um, are tending to, to offshore more. The risks of outsourcing. Once you do it, you lose control over that. So you are no longer in control of the quality of the safety. Um, you know, if it's manufacturing, it could be safety related. Uh, anything is quality. But think about um, uh, call centers. You know, a lot of that's off, off, outsourced now or offshored, and and they're not going to care about your company quite as much as you do. If they're manufacturing the same thing for five different companies, you know, you're not, and so it's not as important to them as it is to you. The quality um, is another one. Um, a lot of people offshore because they save money and then it ends up being a lower quality. So uh, that's, that's um, um, again, the, the, poly, the, the safety requirements in other countries isn't the same. So if you're, if you're offshoring it, you have to make sure they're maintaining your same safety standards. Some other things are the logistics of transporting it. Um, the workforce policies in third world companies, that becomes very, very tricky because um, sometimes you're like, well, the working conditions aren't as good. And so if you don't send, it's it's complicated because we can't assume that the, the living conditions and the working conditions in other countries are exactly the same as they are here. Uh, and so it is cheaper, but, but anyway, but so... I know it's not as good there, but maybe it's still a good job for them. And so, uh, so is it good or bad? That's, that's, that's a very complicated issue right there. Um, but it is something to consider. And, um, uh, some, some of these type of concerns, people have had problems with quality or ideas being stolen, that kind of stuff. And then you end up seeing them bringing it back in. Um, so there's a little bit of trend towards that. Also with supply chain, it's um, very important with forecasting. We talk about demand planning, uh, estimating how much I'm going to have to buy. So I, I estimate sales and I work it backwards. I make my production off, my schedules off of that and kind of say, all right, and how much time is it going to take me? And and um, you have to be much, much better at this than you used to. So um, when we fell into the recession in 2007 um, and 2008, uh a lot of people, if they'd just been looking at the past production, would have greatly overproduced. So you have to look at what you've done in the past, but you also have to try and keep an eye on the future so that you don't end up um, short or, or over, because, again, that could be very costly. It's not easy to do, but um, but it is kind of important there. So um, supply chain managers and marketing managers and salespeople all look together to generate these forecasts. Again, it should start with the sales forecast and work backwards through the system, and then um, and then you plan that backwards. Okay, I'm going to need the shipping people ready here, and I'm going to need the production here, and so I'm going to need to purchase it and kind of work backwards there, and, and really trying to make this information visible to everybody. Inventory control is the process of making sure that you have an adequate amount of products to meet your customer needs, but again, hopefully not more than you need. And then the, the chapter also went on to go, to go through quite a few um, different terms related to inventory, just kind of basic uh, vocabulary terms there that you can probably handle yourself. How we track this stuff. Again, um, companies spend a lot of money on inventory control systems and inventory tracking systems. And the only reason they're willing to spend that much money is because the increased efficiency saves them even more money. So if Walmart's going to spend a billion dollars on the, um, revamping their inventory system, it's because it's going to save them more than that. So huge, huge numbers here. Um, electronic product codes are, you know, you're probably used to seeing like a barcode. Um uh, a barcode might be the same for everyone, a product. An electronic product code is like that, but a little more specific. So I can tell this TV from this TV, not just that the same type, but I know this specific TV down to the serial number and this one. And RFID tags is what the, uh, the uh, uh, well, uh, along these lines, this is kind of what we're talking about with the, uh, the activity or the discussion for this week. But this is a radio signal, and there's a couple videos here that you can kind of take a look at. They're, they're really pretty interesting, but they can just scan like a whole palette of products all at once and know everything that's in there, and they don't have to 
a lot of times they have you know kind of a machine that'll manually scan it in there so they don't have to so it can save them huge amounts of time and make their information really much more uh, precise and efficient some people freak out about that a little bit they think you know if I have clothes that was RFID then it's tracking me but it's really not because it has to be within a few feet of the reader you know and those and then it can't track you after that so not that it can't be built that way later but that's not how it's being used right now but you, you can take a look at those videos they're kind of interesting or ones from the discussion so um, if you chose RFID or even if you didn't after you post your discussion you can go ahead and back and read other people's and see what kind of um, articles they found about that and how it affects um, different people throughout the supply chain warehouses and distribution centers um, uh, we have to, um, and you know, where we live here, you know, right at the intersection of 81 and 70, we have lots and lots of warehousing things. Um, you, you can have these gigantic ones and you can have, uh, I think Amazon was moving to, from, uh, big gigantic ones to m more, uh, you know, instead of a couple huge ones to a bunch of smaller ones, because then it gets a little bit closer to these things and distribution center, um, that has that, but then also has the uh, the trucking there, kind of with it, um, um, processing and moving them to the to to anybody rather than. So this is more on storage, and this is more on shipping, um, moving it. The distribution center is on moving, and this is more on storing. A lot of times they're both, um, and you see stuff here. But uh, Amazon, I think, is genius at um, at really this whole process, and that's how they can get stuff here in a day, you know, and um, uh, accurately predicting that. I, I, I still don't know how they do it, but um, transportation is also part of the supply chain process. So um, logistics is the flow of materials, and um, again, there's it's uh, it's becoming more and more and more data driven to be more and more and more efficient. Um, trucks, almost everything has to come by truck at some point. So trucks are very Im important. Um, water is, uh, is big for international because it's the cheapest way to get things here internationally. Air can be used internationally. And so it's, it's used for time sensitive things, but it can be very expensive. It's a very high cost. So if it's not time sensitive, more likely if it's international, it'll come by water. Railroads, um, you know, they fall somewhere in between. Uh, again, if you, especially if you're going over land, it's going to be cheaper than air, uh, um, but not quite as fast as air. And then pipelines are used for like natural gases and chemicals and, and those types of things. So those are also, um, water would be cheaper, air would be the most expensive, and these rest of them fall somewhere in between there. And then I think the last thing in here is reverse logistics, which is running things backwards through the supply chain to get value. So stuff that, you know, turn trash into cash, stuff that would have just been byproducts or um, trash to try to get something out of that. It's greener, you know, um, upscaling is kind of like that. Uh, I have a, a video here, zoo do people, zoos um, take, you know, animal waste and make uh, stuff out of it. Sometimes it's just fertilizer I saw paper made of elephant poo before, but there's all kinds of things like that where people took stuff that, um, that, so they might promote it as being green, but really it's to increase their profits. Well, and if you can do both, that's, you know, both at the same time, then that's a, that's a win-win, but there's an increased, rather than just trashing the stuff, what can I do with this and, and increase, increase the value in there somewhere. So there you go. There's chapters eight and nine.